Discovering Jesus. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I started out with some interesting thoughts about Jesus when I became a Christian. Um, I had what TV told me, what internet told me, what all the different churches I visited told me. It was an interesting experience, to say the least. Um, so discovering Jesus. And we're going verse by verse through the book of John. Uh, the book of John is a beautiful book, so I thought that was the perfect book. I felt the Lord lead me in that. So we're literally going to go verse by verse, and we're going to be doing that till the end of October. Now we'll take some breaks throughout that, but we're going to cover the book of John. Now, I'm not a person who likes to invite myself to people's events. Uh, most of you who've talked to me even for five minutes know that about me. Um, I love to be around people. I love to do things with people, but I am just the type of person that I was not raised to invite myself to do that because I feel like I'm intruding. Do any of y'all ever feel that way? Like you just feel like you're intruding, like, hey, why don't you let me just go and go with that for you? Oh, you're going to eat? I'm coming with you. Or, oh, you're going to the movies? I'm going to be the third wheel. You know, I, it just feels like an intrusion. You know, people will say, just come on to the house whenever. I would love to come to your house, but very rarely I'm going to say, I'm coming to your house. I, I, I need that invite. I need that invite to do those things. And that's a part of me uh, because I don't want to intrude. I don't want to be that person. Uh, but again, I love to be invited to do life with other people. I am definitely an extrovert, as most of you probably know. The majority of the time, I love people. I love being, I, I get filled being around other people. Being invited to do life with other people makes me feel good. Now, I don't always respond with the same excitement and the same anticipation when Jesus invites me to do life with him. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, I struggle with that. And so... What I have for us today, the two main truths for us today for the sermon, are the following. The first is, whether Jesus is Lord of your life or not, he invites you to follow him every day. Whether you are a Christian or not a Christian, he invites you to follow him every day. If you're a Christian, he is inviting you to walk in his steps, to, to journey with him in the purposes that he has for you that day. If you're not a believer in Christ, you have an open invitation every single day to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. He's a good God like that. And so the second truth for today is this. What you do with Jesus' daily invite matters in this life and in the life to come. What I would say to that is, is that there is going to be a time where we're going to say, here I am. We're going to be before the Father. We're going to be before Jesus. And Jesus is going to claim us if we belong to Jesus Christ. He's going to say, they're my children. They are covered by my righteousness. They are covered by my grace. I am enough. But then the Father is going to ask us that second question. What is that question? What did you do with my son Jesus? What did you do with the invite that Jesus offered you each day? See, sometimes we like to live off the, 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 the accepting of the invite that we did years ago. Or months ago, or weeks ago, or just yesterday, but then we kind of get lackadaisical about the invite that he's giving us today. And so what I want for us to do is to understand that Jesus wants to do life with us. Jesus wants to do life with us. So I want you all to repeat after me by saying the following. Jesus wants me, Jesus wants me to do life with him. Life. Now do not forget that. Anytime you ever feel distant from Jesus, understand it's not Jesus, it's not God. He wants to do life with you. He wants you to do life with him. He is inviting you to do so, and so we just have to accept the invite. Amen? So before we dive into God's word, let us pray. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, as we're about to dive into the book of John, as we're about to study more about Jesus and looking at how you invite others and how others accept that invitation and then what they do with that invitation, Lord, God, I pray that we will just be filled by your spirit. Lord, I pray that we will be emptied of this world. I pray that we will put all the burdens, all the thoughts, all the worries, and put them all aside and then just focus our eyes on your word, on you, and on your spirit, and on what you purpose for us this day. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Now, if you don't yet belong to Jesus, there's going to be an opportunity for you to make that decision at the end of this message. But I would still invite you to journey along with us. So today, again, we're reading from the book of John, chapter 1. Last week, we ended at verse 34. So where do you think we're going to start today? 35. 35, verse 35. John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 35. It's in the New Testament. It's after the book of Luke. And it's before the book of Acts. So it's, it's kind of sandwiched in there. Luke, John, Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And while you're finding John chapter 1, verse 35, let me share some things. 
John was written by a disciple, a student of Jesus's named John. All right. So John was written by John. He was one of the 12 disciples and his father's name was Zebedee. And so he would have been John Bar Zebedee, which is John son of Zebedee. And his brother's name was James. He and his family were fishermen. These are important things to note so that as you're reading, you understand why he's saying certain things the way he does. And John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. John most likely wrote this book while living in Ephesus around the time of 80 AD. I learned from last week I need to say that kind of slow. And John died in 98 AD. And so he wrote this book to two different audiences. He wrote it to Jewish people, people like him, and he wrote it to Gentiles, everybody else. And he wanted everyone to have a clear perspective of who Jesus is and why that's important. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I love John, and I told you this last week, is 90% of what he wrote is unique to the other three Gospels. So when you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you're reading that, and you see that repetition, when you get to John, you're like, I don't remember that, I don't remember that, and I certainly don't remember that. And so I love the Gospel of John because of its uniqueness. Now let's begin John chapter 1. Verse number 35. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. Verse 37. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. So we're now at day three. Let me remind you what day one and two was. Day one was John the Baptist proclaiming that the Messiah was coming. He had started this ministry, he had been doing this ministry, and then he's saying, guys, he's coming, he's coming, I'm here to prepare the way. And then day two was, he came, Jesus showed up, and surprise, it's your relative, Jesus, and he ends up baptizing Jesus, and so that was day two. Now, day three is John, like, I heard it said this way, so the first character in day one is John, the second day is John and Jesus, day three is Jesus and John, and then day four is simply Jesus. And so it's interesting how the, 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 the writer writes this out. And so John is saying right here that he wants his people, John the Baptist, to say, I want y'all to follow Jesus. Y'all been following me, now it's time to follow Jesus. Think about that for a second. John the Baptist's ministry is doing amazing, yet is what he's doing is, is it's all about Jesus. He points people to Jesus at the expense of his own fame. You know, one thing I've told you before is I, I, I'm afraid of being famous. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be one of those guys who, who is on TV and all that. And here's the reason why. I see all these pastors and church leaders fall because they let their guard down. Now, I know you're saying that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to. I know that. But I just don't think I'm ready for that, to be completely honest with you. But John the Baptist had all these people giving him all this attention, all this credit, even some glory, and just, just heaping it on. And here's what he does. And puts it on Jesus. Literally, in this situation, he puts it all on Jesus. Look, there is the Lamb of God. This is the one I've been preparing you for. I just think that's amazing. You see, serving Jesus is, is all about making Jesus known. Not making ourselves known. Not making our name known. That's one reason I love Halloween Baptist. Yes, uh, we want people to know where we are. Uh, we're going to be talking about that tonight, about getting a road sign. Uh, we've got some permission to do that, so we're really excited about that. We want people to know where we are. But when they get here, they want we want them to all know about who? Jesus. It's not about our church. It's not about what we've done or what we're doing. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. John the Baptist got that, and we need to remember that. Uh, I, John the Baptist just kind of fades from the scene, and the intention now centers solely on Jesus Christ. Now, verse number 38, continuing on, says this. Jesus looked around, and he saw them follow him. What do you want? Or your translation might say, seek. What are you seeking? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? You see, why did John explain that it means teacher? Because remember, he has a Jewish audience, but he also has a Gentile audience. And so he does this throughout the book of John. I think it's like six or seven times where he translates for the reader so that they understand what, what's going on. And so Jesus, he sees these people following. What do you want? What are you seeking? And they're like, teacher, 
where you stay. So what are they wanting to do? They're wanting to follow Jesus. They're wanting to know more. They're in the seeking mode. See, following Jesus is not enough. We must follow him for the right reasons. Let me point that out again. Following him is not enough. We, we need to follow him for the right reasons. So I love Jesus' response. We're going to see that in a second. But also, to follow Jesus for our own purposes would be like asking Jesus to follow us. To follow Jesus for our own purposes is inviting Jesus to follow us, to align with us, to support and advance our cause, not his own. Uh, just yesterday, I was talking to a brother in Christ on the phone, and we were talking about a controversial uh, subject. We were talking about um, Abram and, and the Old Testament, where Abram and Sarai, uh, Abraham and Sarah, you may know them as that, where what happens is, is he gets himself in a sticky situation. He heads to Egypt, and he's fearful of his life, and so he tells his wife, Sarah, hey, you're going to act like you're my sister. And so what ends up happening? Well, what ends up happening is, is the Pharaoh takes notice and is like, you're a beautiful woman. I want you to be a part of my harem. And so what we know is, is that she becomes a part of that. And so the question that we had asked was, well, did he sleep with her? The answer is, I don't know. Now, in another instance, yes, Abraham did this twice to his wife. Yeah, they had a rocky marriage, I'm sure, in some areas. <laughs> All right. And so in another instance, we know that the scripture tells us that God protected Sarah from that situation as far as that she was put in that situation, but before there could be physical contact. But we don't know about the situation. And so, first of all, we got to say, Father Abraham, you know, we, we love Father Abraham, but then he acts like this. And so what do we do with this? What do we do when there are things in the Bible that we're just shaking our head at? Either we can sweep it under the rug and say, I'm just going to ignore that. Or we can make it mold to what we want it to say, right? Think about what we put on babies' nurseries. I'm just going to be honest with you. I laugh. And if you've done this, I love you. <laughs> I laugh when I see Noah's Ark on babies' nurseries. <laughs> because in my mind, my gruesome mind, here's what I'm imagining. <clears throat> Bodies floating around in the water. I mean, I'm just being honest here. But we leave that part out, right? Because that's not pretty. That's not something that we put in the children's book. Hey, Joshua. <laughs> or David cutting off the head of Goliath. Or we can do what God wants us to do, and it's to accept it, to study it, and to trust it. Was God approving of Abraham's decisions? Absolutely not. But Abraham had, and in my opinion, Sarah, both had some, some learning and growing up to do. And so in this situation, Jesus, I love, what do you seek? What do you want? We need to remember that we are not following Jesus so that he can follow us. That we are following Jesus so that we can surrender it all to him. Amen? Verse number 39. Come and see. I love Jesus' response. Come and see, he said. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Uh, so I want to just give you kind of an understanding, because I like to give you a little bit of understanding on some things. We're not really sure what time it was. I know that this said about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the time was either Roman time that John was referring to, which would be 10 a.m., or it would be Jewish time, which is 4 p.m., um, they had different kind of ways that they kept time, and so we're not certain exactly what time, but as a matter of no, they spent a lot of time with Jesus. And what I'd say to this, though, is that Jesus' response was come and see. He didn't, like, try to, to make sure that they knew all the answers to all the questions. You know, I think we, we forget sometimes that uh, it's okay to just invite someone in your life and let them see Jesus in your life, even if they don't agree with you. Like, it's okay to spend time with lost people and, and them to know you're a Christian and just let them witness your, your, your Christianity instead of trying to just force feed it down them. Or, you know, for instance, like, if somebody wants to serve, well, you need to know uh, this question, and you need to be able to explain the Trinity, and you need to be able to do this, and, and they're just like, oh, I just wanted to serve and, like, hand out bulletins, man. I just, I just wanted to serve on the music. I just want... We need to accept people where they are because otherwise they're never going to get where Jesus wants them. Amen? Come and see. Come and see. We must examine our motives for following him. Are we seeking his glory, or are we seeking our own glory? That is the question. 
Now, we're about to talk about, honestly, one of my favorite disciples, because this disciple is only known, really, when you see him, for bringing people to Jesus. That's what he's known for. And so I love this disciple. His name is Andrew. Verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who had heard what John said and then followed Jesus. See, we see in the life of Andrew that he is continuously bringing people to Jesus. Remember the feeding of the 5,000 and the little boy that's brought to Jesus? Guess who brought the little boy to Jesus? Andrew. He's just known for bringing people to Jesus. I love Andrew's life. So when you're serious about Jesus, you're going to want others to know and to follow him too. Now, raise your hand if you want others to follow him. Let's just be honest here. Raise your hand if you get a little scared about inviting people to follow Jesus. Come on, let's be honest. I get that way sometimes. All right? And so Andrew, he just said, let's just do this thing. So I have a question for you. How many people have you attempted to bring to Jesus recently? And that's a, that's a, I know, pin drop, I know. Because that question challenges me at times. Because you can say recently and say, like, just in the last week, or the month, or year, or just your Christian life. How many people have you been inviting to Jesus? And see, you're saying, are you judging? No, I'm not judging you, because here's the fact. Um, I can say, yeah, you know, I invited people to Jesus Monday. What about Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? And Friday? There's no way where I'm ever going to be able to say, I just, just follow my example. No, we follow the example of Scripture. Amen? Now, verse number 41 says this. It says, Andrew went to find his brother, Simon, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. You know what I love about this? It's a very simple, very simple, very simple statement. See, Messiah is the Hebrew term, and Christ is the Greek term. So again, he's trying to cover, he's trying to make sure that they understand, but they both refer to the anointed one, the long-awaited one, the one that everybody's been waiting for to save us all. We found the Messiah. That's all he says. We have found the Messiah. It's not a complicated sentence. We don't have to be great preachers, great speakers. We need only tell men about the Lord Jesus in the simplest and the truest of words, and God will take care of the rest. We just need to tell people about Jesus. The Word of God is sufficient. That's one of the reasons I love preaching books of the Bible so much, is I just want the Scripture to jump out and talk to you. And then I'll talk a little bit, but I want the Scripture to be what you're focusing on. Because the Word of God is the Word of God, amen? And we found the Messiah. It's that simple. Hey, would you like to, to worship Jesus with me? And if you know they're not a Christian, hey, would you just like to come with me and I'll take you to lunch afterwards? You don't have to enjoy it. Just come. We need to do what we can to bribe people to Jesus and then let them make their own decision. You know what I mean? We need to make it a point when people see us that they look and they say, man, those people just can't stop telling people about Jesus. They can't stop inviting people to Jesus. We need to be more like Andrew. I need to be more. I think we all could be a little bit more like Andrew. Amen? We have found the Messiah. Now, some of you might be curious, like myself, well, who was that other disciple that John the Baptist uh, sent with Jesus? Personally, I believe it was the Apostle John that wrote this book. Um, there are some eyewitness accounts that he, I mean, he talks about the time of day and things like that. So just if you're curious, I suspect that that's what it was, is it was John. Now, moving on to verse 42. Then Andrew, so not only does he say we found the Messiah, then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. You see, Simon means he has heard. That's, that's what his name means. But Jesus says, No, 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 no. You're Cephas. You're Peter, which means a rock or a stone. Now, some of you, if you've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're like, dude, that guy is not a rock. He is not a stone. That joker is a wave. He's blowing in the wind. He's blowing around and everything. But when you read the book of Acts, you see someone who's been transformed by Christ. You see someone who's bold, who's preaching, who's proclaiming. And it's not with complicated words. But it's literally with simple words because the people say, look, they're not even educated, but they're taking on the world for Jesus. Jesus can look in you and he can see the potential in you. You just have to accept it. You have to accept what Jesus sees in you. Some of you, I'm looking at future missionaries, where you're going to go to other countries. Some of you, I'm looking at people who are going to be great evangelists, people who are going to tell the world about Jesus, and you're going to be better at it than most. Some of you are going to be very discerning, and so you're going to have the, the gift of discernment, the gift of prophecy, to be able to speak and say, here's what I'm seeing, here's what the Spirit is telling me. 
Some of you have the gift of singing, and you know I don't have that gift, and so God might give you that gift, and you might come, and you might lead us in a song of worship, and praise God for that. Some of you, you have all these other gifts. Some of you are great with your hands, and God wants to use those gifts. He wants to use what you have to offer him, but you've got to accept what Jesus says. Amen? Peter had to learn to accept that he was, in fact, the rock, the stone, that Jesus saw that, and Jesus wasn't wrong. <clears throat> I would say this, Jesus knew that Peter would follow him, but Peter still had to make the decision to do so. Don't forget that. It wasn't Jesus saying, this is what you're going to do. This is what I see for the potential of your life. Follow me. Moving on to verse number 43. The next day, Jesus decided, or your scripture might say purpose, I like that word better, purpose, to go to Galilee. Uh, he found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Uh, Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew, and Peter's hometown. Now, I love this. Uh, Jesus is deciding. He's purposing to go somewhere. When Jesus purposes to go somewhere, he has a purpose. He has a reason. Amen? So what I would invite you to do, when you go to work, you purpose to go to work. When, when you're in your neighborhood, you purpose to be in your neighborhood. When you're a husband and you decide to, to, to have children, you and your wife, you purpose to be a godly father. When you, you're, you're a husband, you purpose to be a godly husband. You purpose to be a godly wife. You purpose, you purpose. We are to live life on purpose because if we don't live life on purpose, we're going to live it on what? Accident. How many of you have accidentally got yourself in a lot of trouble? <clears throat> we got to live life on purpose. Jesus was purposing. He, had, he knew that he was going to be seeing Philip. And what does he say to him? Does he give out this big speech? Blah, 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 come follow me. Come follow me. So we're on the fourth day, and now Jesus is inviting people to follow him. This was unusual. See, the custom practice was for a person who wanted to be a disciple to take the initiative to approach the rabbi, the teacher, and ask to join to follow him, to ask for permission to say, hey, can I be one of your students? But instead, Jesus is going to the people that nobody wants, and he says, I want you to be one of my students. That is who Jesus is. He wants you all to be one of his students. All of you. Verse number 45 Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Now, when you see the son of Joseph, just to give you uh, an understanding, I mentioned it early. Uh, the son of is a phrase. So Jesus wasn't known as Jesus Christ. Like when people, hey, Jesus Christ. No, that was not his last name. Uh, what he would have been known as is Jesus bar Joseph. Jesus, son of Joseph. And so whenever, uh, I'm telling you that for a reason, because we're about to run into a guy, and I want to tell you who I believe that guy is and who many scholars believe that guy is, because it's important. And so we see right here, it says, uh, Philip went to look for Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel ends up being a disciple of Christ. Many people, including myself, believe this is Bartholomew. All right, what does Bartholomew's name start with? Bar. What does Bar mean? Son of. And so many people believe this was Nathaniel bar Tholomew. Nathaniel, son of Tholomew. The reason is because we don't see Nathaniel in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but we see Bartholomew. Does that make sense? So I want you to understand so that when you're seeing this, you see the spider webs tying together. All right? And so Philip went to look for Nathaniel and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. When you're serious about Jesus, it doesn't take long to develop the habit of being a witness for Jesus Christ. You can't help but tell people about what God is doing in your life, what Jesus is doing in your life. You know the times when I'm the worst witness is the times when I am the worst student. The times when I am horrible at telling people and inviting people to Jesus is the times when I'm kicking and screaming on the purposes that Jesus has for my life, but I'm just not wanting to be a part of that. Moving on to verse number 46. <laughs> I love this. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. I love how, how Philip responds. He doesn't even just acknowledge any of that. Just come on and see. No, man. What, what you gonna do? All right? So what, what was his problem with Nazareth? Well, let me give you some, some understanding about Nazareth. All right? Nazareth was part of Galilee. Now, Galilee itself 
uh, was a Jewish area, but it would have had a lot of foreigners involved in there. And so the rest of Jerusalem and so forth, well, they looked at Galilee, the region of Galilee, and they looked down on them. Now, Galilee looked down on Nazareth. <laughs> because Nazareth, uh, let me tell you some things about Nazareth. I want to remember all the things that I kind of learned that I want to share with you guys. So, uh, first of all, one thing you do need to know is Nazareth, Nazareth was not mentioned in prophecy in the Old Testament. And so one thing that Daniel is saying is, I don't remember Nazareth being mentioned in the prophecies and the promises that God had given. And so he doesn't know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which was prophesied in Scripture hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. He doesn't know that fact. And then what else you need to know is, again, uh, it's a, it, Nazareth is a mix of cultures, a mix of idols, a mix of uh, different things. And so it wasn't strictly Jewish. And so there was a lot of... Uh, people that judged him for being so, but also, um, what also was, is it was near the crossroads of several trade routes, so therefore it had contact with many cultural influences that Jews considered sinful. And so these trade routes, people would come into Nazareth, they would come in, right? And then, something that we don't know for sure, but tradition says that there was a Roman fortress, a garrison in Nazareth as well. Guess what? Jews did not like Romans. <laughs> and so Nazareth just had, it, like, it, it's almost like Nazareth. Like, oh my goodness, Nazareth. It's kind of like Las Vegas, you know, Sin City. You know what I'm saying? Like, Nazareth, what are you talking about? That's kind of the mindset of Nathaniel. And so it's not a bad mindset because he's understanding, like, he's not a bad person, but he's got some preconceptions. He has some pre-ideas. But I love Philip's response. Come and see for yourself. Do you know I've, I've got people to come to church by just challenging them? Just challenging them. Because like, they'll, they'll say, man, I've been to churches. Nah, no, I ain't going back. I'm like, why don't you come on and try it out? Prove me wrong. <laughs> people like to be challenged. I'm just going to be honest with you. Because I've seen times where I'm like, all right, I will prove you wrong. I'm going to come and I'm going to hate it. <laughs> and then we'll be sitting down and, we, and we'll be eating you know, afterwards. Because I do like, free lunch. You know? And they'll be like, all right, I enjoy myself. <laughs> We've got to just be, come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. Verse 47. As they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. Now remember, this is Jesus speaking of Nathaniel. And then verse 48. How do you know about me, Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. And then Nathaniel exclaimed, Rabbi, Teacher, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus sure does know how to make a strong case to follow him, does he not? But you still have to make the choice to follow him. Like, I'm just going to be honest with you. I told you, hard-headed, stubborn, stupid. And so there are many times where God has had to physically get up in my business and say, James, it's time to get your act together, son. And if I chose, even though he's making a good case, if I chose to say, yeah, whatever, and just keep walking in that, he's going to let me be in my mess. He's going to be stewed. And he's going to be bad. It's going to hurt. It's going to feel bad. But I love this. Jesus, he makes his case, but he lets us decide. He lets you make the decision whether you're going to accept that case. And so Jesus made a strong case for Nathaniel to follow him. See, he knows the real you. And he still gives you the invitation to follow him. Think about it for a second. He knows what you did last night. He knows what you said to your husband on the way to church. He knows the thoughts that you had. He knows the past decisions that you've made. He knows them all. And as we studied in Sunday school this morning, as we were going through the book of Luke, what I love is, is he's never doing this. He's never pushing your face away. He's never pushing you away. He's like, no, too filthy, too dirty. No, he sees you better than you see yourself. And he says, I've been waiting for you. Come into my arms. Oftentimes, in my opinion, I mentioned this in Sunday school, when I go to repent to Jesus, when I go to repent to God, because I'm being a fool, I'm being foolish, I don't even get to finish the words before I feel the grace of God just cover me. God, I can't believe I was doing this. How did I just get off train? Before I can even finish the words, I feel the Spirit of God just assuring me of His love for me. 
This is the God that I'm inviting you to worship. If you are not a believer, and if you are a believer, this is the God that I'm inviting you to allow to be the Lord and Savior of your life each day, not just one day. <clears throat> you know what's interesting is there was no spyware in that day. <laughs> I wonder what the Daniel's thinking. How the heck did he know that? Like, you know, like what? But now today, like, let's just be honest here. We'd be like, oh, he must have access to Google. All right, because Google's always listening. You know, Apple's always listening. You know, oh, that's what happened. And there's some spyware. There was no spyware, but the truth is, is that the Son of God, the, the Father, the, the Holy Spirit, they don't need spyware. They're the ultimate spyware. They are able to give you and you and you and me their undivided attention any point anytime. Every person, all seven something billion people on the planet. That is the God that we worship. Amen? Let me ask you a question. What if Nathaniel had stuck to his original preconceived ideas about Jesus? And what if he decided to never go with Philip? You know, Philip said, come and see. What if Nathaniel said, now nah, I'm good. He would have missed out on the blessing. But can I tell you something? He could have said that. And so some of you are afraid to even just say, come and see. What I'm telling you is, is you never know when someone is waiting, they're starving for you to invite them to church, for you to invite them to a Bible study, to Sunday school. I'm telling you, invite them to Sunday school and, and, and say, you know, I just want you to come and it's a Bible study. We do it on 945. I'd love you to come and be a part of my Sunday school. Because here's the thing, Sunday school entrenches you deeper than just coming to church. It just does. Uh, psychology teaches that. Uh, studies have taught that. It's just true. The more entrenched you are with another group of believers, the more you're going to be committed to Christ and to the local church. And so invite people. Say, come and see. Come on and see. It's important for us to note that. Just come and see. Verse number 50. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You're going to see greater things than this. Before we even continue with verse 51, I think this is just hilarious. I can imagine Jesus' face. Like, I'm going to read it trying to like act like I would be if I were Jesus. <laughs> Do you believe just because I told you I'd seen you under the fig tree? <laughs> We're going to see greater things than this, dude. It's coming. Like, I imagine that was Jesus' reaction, because Jesus is like, he knows all that's coming. He knows the amazing things that Nathaniel is going to get to be a part of. And he's just like, okay, <laughs> just wait till you see what fits in my box. I would remind you, don't put Jesus in a box. The only box, I tell you every single week, the only box that God fits in, that Jesus fits in, is this box that he's given us. It's called the Word of God. It's that simple. It's that simple. So what I would invite you to do I would invite you to join Jesus for the ride. To join him for the ride. Because it's going to be an amazing ride. It's going to be a challenging ride. But it's going to be an amazing ride. And so if you're a believer in Christ and you've been struggling in your faith, repent. I'm telling you. I promise you. You get to the point where you see yourself as the sinner that you are and that you haven't been behaving like you belong to Jesus, even though you have a relationship with Jesus. He's going to stop you before you can even finish the sentence because he's been waiting for you. And he wants to embrace you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to accept you. But if you are not a believer, he's offering you the same thing. He wants to embrace you. He wants to accept you. He wants to forgive you. Never forget that. And then verse 51, then he said, he being Jesus, I tell you the truth, you will see, you will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man. And then this translation like adds a description, kind of, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Now, I personally believe that the disciples understood this prediction better after Jesus had went back to heaven with the Father. Um, there were a lot of things that Jesus said that now, because we have hindsight, we can look and say, well, how did they miss this? It's because they were in their own lifestyle, in their own sin, and we miss things. Any of y'all ever miss something that was right in front of you? I mean, come on now. All right? I'm, just, I'm, I'm not going to say who, but there was something that was missing in our house, and we were looking everywhere, and it was in the place that it belonged. All 
all right? It was in the place that it normally would be, and, and we didn't find it. Um, you know, and she's shaking her head, she's like, I'm going to get you for that. All right. <laughs> but the truth is, I've been there. Like, she'll tell you, there, there are two things that I lose more than anything. What is it? The remote and the keys. <laughs> like, where's the remote? What did you do with the remote? Like, what did I do with the remote? I'm like, never mind. <laughs> the truth is this. There are some things that we may not understand, and that's okay. But we will understand what God sees fit for us to understand them. See, the Son of Man, which Jesus referred to himself as, was one of our Lord's favorite titles for himself. The vision in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, if you want to write that down, it, it presents the Son of Man in a definite messianic setting. And, and Jesus uses this title in the same way. He connects himself with that prophecy in Daniel. And verse 51 is a statement that is referring to Jacob's experience with his dream in Genesis 28, 12. Remember Jacob's ladder, where there's the ladder, and Jesus is saying, I'm better than the ladder. I'm the bridge. I'm the way to have a personal relationship with the Father. He is the bridge between heaven and earth. The more time that we devote to getting to know Jesus, the more we will understand and appreciate all that he is and all that he has called you and me to. I promise you this. The more you spend devoting to this, the more you spend on your knees in prayer, the more you spend in Sunday school with other believers in Christ, the more you spend in worship, the more you spend serving Him. That's a very good part of being a Christian. The more you spend doing the things of God, the better you're going to see of God. The more clear you're going to see of God. This morning, um, I was a little bit of in a hurry when I was taking a shower. And so I was just throwing soap everywhere as I'm trying to, like, you know, and it, boom, soap in my eye. <sighs> soap in my eye. So naturally, like, what happened? Uh, and so the more that I spent trying to get that, like, going on, like, blinking and doing all that, the, the, the queerer the picture got. It's the same thing with the Father. The more we spend with Him, the better we get to know of Him. Uh, it's the same thing with a husband and a wife. The more that I spend with my wife, the more I appreciate her, the more I see her for who she is. And I promise you that's what it will be with the Son, and that's what it will be with the Father, and that's what it will be with the Holy Spirit. And so I remind you that whether Jesus is Lord of your life or not, that he invites you to follow him every day. And I also remind you that what you do with Jesus' daily invite matters in this life and in the life to come. In today's readings, there were many people who received an invitation to follow Jesus. There were many people who decided to follow Jesus. There were many people who invited others to follow Jesus. They were all unique in their own way. They were different people. But each person responded in different ways. It's okay if you respond in a different way, but the key way, the, the way that we need to be united in and how we respond is yes, Lord. I'm going to talk to you about that in invitation. Yes, Lord. That needs to be our response when he invites us. Yes, Lord. It's okay that we're different. It's okay that we have different ways, different personalities, but yes, Lord. As Christians, Jesus is inviting us to let him lead and guide our lives all day with the small decisions and the big decisions that we make. And we will see this unfold throughout the disciples' lives as we study the book of John as they walk with Jesus. And so how do you usually respond to Jesus' invitation as a Christian? How do you respond when he says, I want you to spend a little bit more time in the Word today? Or, I don't know about you, but there have been times where I've finished doing my daily reading, and God says, I'm not done with you yet. Keep that open. I've had that happen before. There are other times where I'm praying, and like I've, I've gone over my list, and, and I'm praying, and God's like, I'm not done with you yet. We've got some more things to talk about. I've got some things to show you. How are you responding to the invitation that Jesus is laying before you as believers in Christ? If you want to do better at that, if you want to be a healthier disciple of Jesus Christ, I invite you to repeat this prayer. You can say it out loud. You can say it quietly, uh, you can say it in your head, you can just read it, whatever way you want to do it. There's no pressure, but if this is what you want to do, you want to be a healthier disciple of Jesus Christ, and you want to be better at accepting the invitation that Jesus gives you, I would invite you to go along with me in this. God, thank you for inviting me into the plans and purposes that you have for me each day. I know that I can do better by following you and your word each day. Help me want to follow you better each day. 
Help me invite others to follow you each day. In Jesus' name, amen. That is a prayer that God will honor. That is a prayer that he wants you to pray. That is a prayer that he will bless. Now, Christians, this is a time to be seriously praying for those who have chosen to not make Jesus their Lord of their life right now. It's not time for you to tune out. It's time for you to um, spiritual warfare. It's time for you to put on the boots and let's get praying. Because there are people probably in this room, uh, there are definitely of the four or 500 people that watch uh, online, there are people that are lost and without Christ that watch, and we need to be praying for them right now. Now, if you happen to be that person, You've been invited to Jesus before, probably. You, you, you know that. And you've, if you're not a Christian, then you haven't accepted that. You haven't submitted to that. And so what you first need to decide is, is do you even believe in Jesus? Do you even believe in Jesus? So I'm going to slide for That's the first question. Do you believe in Jesus? You see, what does that even mean? What it means is, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe it to be true? Do you believe what I'm telling you about who Jesus is? What happened to Jesus? The life that he lived. That he's alive today, even though he died on the cross for your sins, and he was resurrected on the third day by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then he floated and ascended up into heaven. Do you believe that stuff that I'm talking about? And if the answer is, yes, I believe that, then the second question you need to ask is, do you belong to Jesus? Because the Bible tells us there's going to be 20 people who believe, but do not belong, and they're going to be in hell. And it's not because God didn't want them to belong. It's because they chose to choose religion or churchianity over disciple of Christ. And so if you don't belong to Jesus, then what I would ask you is, why not? What's kept you from belonging to Jesus up to this point? What is it that has kept you from saying, I surrender all? I give you all of my addictions. I give you all of my sins. I give you my marriage. I give you it all. I just want to be yours, Jesus. What is it that's kept you? And if there's, if you're just saying, man, there's nothing keeping me, then what's keeping you now from making that decision right now? What's keeping you from saying the prayer that I'm going to share with you to say, all right, I'm ready. Because the truth is, is that we have been praying for you, whoever you are. And God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, that they want you. But you have to want him back. You have to admit that you are a sinner. You are sick. And you are in need of a doctor. You are in need of a savior. And the only savior that will supply the cure for that sickness is Jesus. So if that's you, I invite you to simply repeat this prayer. You can say it out loud. You can say it quietly. You can say it in your head. Um, and if you want to let us know, you can come down to the altar, or you can even just fill out a blue card um, and put it in the offering plate, even if you're not a guest. But I would invite you just to repeat this prayer, and it's on the screen so that uh, you can keep up. God, I see that I've sinned against you. I ask you to forgive my sins. I know that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. And today I choose to turn from my sins. I invite you to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. I trust only in you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's you, I, I have a challenge for you. Let someone know. Let someone know that you made that decision. Again, blue card, somehow, come down to the altar. Tell me before you leave, but let somebody know because the church wants to celebrate this with you. But you're saying, maybe that's not me yet. Um, then what I'm praying is that maybe you just move closer to finally saying yes, and maybe next time you'll say yes. But know that Jesus is inviting you every single day. Now, some of you are saying, well, what about me? Like, what am I supposed to do? I'm a believer in Christ. What am I supposed to do with this message? Very simple. Yes, Lord. <laughs> because the truth is, I can't tell you how many times I'm like, oh, wow, Lord, the Lord really worked on my marriage today and your message, and I didn't preach anything. I preached on tithing. I'm like, what? And I'm like, Carol? Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. He can use the Word of God to do His purposes, to accomplish His will. And so whatever it is that the Lord is calling you to do, whatever it is, maybe you, maybe you want to become a member like Miss Paula did today, and maybe you want to know more about it. Come to me. We'll, we'll talk about that. I'll, I'll meet with you. I'll talk with you. 
Um, we'll definitely do that. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you've never accepted that the Bible teaches that you're to be baptized after you submit and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. So maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe you want to serve. Maybe you're already a member and you want to serve within the church. We would love for you to be a part of that. Maybe, maybe you want to know more about Jesus or you want to know more about this. Or maybe you're just struggling to even just breathe. Right now, there's a lot of depression going on around in our country. Maybe you're just struggling each day. I want to help you with that. Jesus wants to help you with that, and he will. And so what you need to respond simply is, what church? Yes, Lord. Uh, we got to say it with more authority. What church? Yes, sir. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whatever it is. Yes, Lord. You want me to give that to you? I've been holding on for 10 years, but here you go. Yes, Lord. I've only been holding for 10 minutes, but here you go. Whatever it is, give it to Jesus. I'm going to pray. And when I say amen, uh, Miss Linda and um, somebody in the music, I'm not sure if all three are coming. <laughs> they're going to come, and they're going to lead us in a song of worship. And we are going to worship Jesus. We're not going to sing a song. We are going to worship Jesus. We're going to follow the lead of those that are worshiping Jesus in front of us. All right? Bow your heads with me, if you will. Heavenly Father. I pray right now. I pray for this church. I pray for those that are watching. I pray for the members, for those that are just a part of our church family, uh, but not yet members, for those who are just attending, for those who are watching, whatever it is, Lord. God, I know that your Holy Spirit is working on their hearts, working on their lives. You're inviting them to trust you with something. You're inviting them to trust you with salvation. You're inviting them to trust you with their marriages. You're inviting them to trust you with their jobs. You're inviting them to trust you with church. You're inviting them to trust you with something, Lord. God, I pray that what we will see is that when we all say amen, that we mean it and we give it all to you and we submit it all to you and we surrender it all to you and we simply respond not just with word, but with heart and with everything we have. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. amen.